I'm just checking it on YouTube and then we shall start in a moment. Perfect. Okay, we are live. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Carvan. I am Ishan Sharma and you are watching the Carvan special lecture titled Art Cinema in India's Forgotten Futures. Carvan, the Heritage Exploration Initiative, uh, is one of India's leading students collective, which was started in 2019 uh, by us. And uh, we all were uh, students of Delhi University at that time. And uh, the basic aim of Carvan is to promote conversations around the shared history and heritage of the Indian subcontinent where we are also trying to revolutionize the way we approach history, especially in the times that we are living in. Since then, we have hosted many heritage walks and online lectures with over 200 guests from across the world, including Professor Romela Thapar, Irfan Habib, Sohail Hashmi, Nasiruddin Shah, Ramachandra Guha, and many more on our platform to rebuild a dialogue about our shared history and heritage. Today, I have with me a very special guest and uh, she has just come out with a new book that I'll show you in a moment. Dr. Rachana Majumdar is a historian of modern India with a focus on Bengal, with her writing span histories of gender and sexuality and Indian, Indian cinema, especially art cinema, music and modern Indian intellectual history. Professor Majumdar also writes on post-colonial history and theory. Her first book, Marriage and Modernity, Family Values in Colonial Bengal, challenges, challenges the assumption that arranged marriage is an antiquated practice. Through extensive and meticulous archival research, she demonstrates that in the late colonial period, Bengali marriage practices underwent changes that led to a valorization of the larger intergenerational family as a reverent. And uh, we would love to have another lecture on this, but moving ahead, coming to the topic itself. Uh, after this, she grew her interest in post-coloniality and there come, came her second work called Writing Post-Colonial History, where she analyzed the impact of post-colonial theory on historiography, something that relates to our today's topic as well. And then her interest grew in the culture and aesthetics of the mass democracy uh, that led her to study cinema, in particular Indian cinema. And her third book, Art Cinema India's Forgotten Futures, that you see on the screen right now, which came out uh, by this uh, wonderful university press, Columbia University Press in 2020. In this book, she analyzed the, the term global art cinema in independent India. And it is also a book about art cinema as a mode of doing history in a post-colonial setting, which of course is a very interesting uh, research uh, and really she has done a wonderful work in doing that. And her work has been supported by the American Institute of Indian Studies and the Henry Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation. She has been a visiting scholar at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Emotions, Berlin and IWM Vienna. Now, art cinema is a very much debated, much often contested term in itself. And filmmakers, because I've had conversations with filmmakers like Sham Benegal and Adur Gopalakrishnan, and they do not really agree with the term art cinema at all. And filmmakers are increasingly, are, they are very cautious about such coinages, fearing that it might limit audience access and endanger their accessibility and economic prospects of the films which is of course after N NFDC, it's of course a very logical reasoning of not associating with the term itself because there are certain features that we kind of attach, are attached to this whole term of art cinema like slow paced uh, or made for a certain kind of audience which is elite in the nature and who might speak in English and do not ever visit villages and such kind of things. So we will kind of, understand the the theme we will kind of ex explore the term art cinema we'll also explore the beginning of art cinema in india from uh, the early 30s and 40s and you know we'll kind of travel through and fro with 
Dr. Rachana Majumdar today. So without taking much time, I'll I'll uh, I'll speak after the session. And thank you so much, ma'am, for accepting our invitation. And uh, over to you. Uh, you want to share the screen, so you, you can go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Ishan. It's it's uh, it's an honor to be speaking on this platform, um, and I will share my screen. And uh, so, you thank you for your for your introduction and also for making the comments that you did. And I hope that we'll have we'll return to some of those comments uh, when we perhaps after I, I make some remarks and, and have, a, have a discussion. Now, um, you know, one question that I have actually been asked about the book since it came out, am I, am I audible to you? Uh, yes, you are audible. Yeah. This sounds good. Okay. So one question that I have uh, been asked quite a bit and I think that'll be a good place for us to begin today is has to do with the title of the book. Why do I call the book Art Cinema in India's Forgotten Futures? And uh, so allow me to, to comment on my remarks today by offering a gloss on that. And I hope that it's also going to give you a sense of the book. Um, and then what I'll do in the second part, or for the for the most part of the talk, is to maybe focus on a single chapter, just so that uh, something that you said over the course of your remarks, that I think of art, art films as a mode of doing history, um, that that becomes, um, that becomes clear, just to illustrate that, that proposition. Now, first, I should say that the expression forgotten futures is an acknowledgement of my debt to the new film history that was pioneered by some of my colleagues at the University of Chicago, notably Miriam Hansen, Tom Gunning, and Yuri Sivian. Uh, one, of, one of the things that these scholars questioned was a teleological understanding of cinema. They refuted a linear developmental account in which the narrative film, excuse me, um, you know, I, um, or never mind. Sorry, I just heard a sound and there's nobody else in my house. I couldn't tell if somebody was banging the door. Anyway, uh, one of the things that they refuted was a linear developmental account in which the narrative film was the acme of film's development. They questioned the stadial notion that everything that preceded narrative cinema, from magic lanterns to the visual and philosophical toys of the 19th century, still photographs silent films that were often denigrated as primitive cinema, were meant to be superseded. They argued instead that looking at cinema's pasts would reveal forgotten film futures. Now, my intention was not so much to theorize the technology, but I take what I take from them is the argument against linearity, the, you know, the argument against a kind of developmental temporality, and consider certain pasts of Indian cinema, which I argue contained in them many forgotten futures. So in a sense, the book is actually about revisiting certain pasts because it's really in those pasts that you have memories of certain presents and futures built in. So it follows from this that in the project of recovering forgotten futures, there's also a commitment to archival recovery. So my book is, uh, and, and you said earlier when we were talking that you finished, you, you finished reading the book. So you'll, you'll have noticed that the first part of the book is actually a history of the category, of the global category that is referred to as art cinema. But it's a history of that global category that is referred to as art cinema in India. And uh, one of the things, again, that you will have noticed 
uh, from your engagement with that first part of the book that in the beginning, in the 1950s or so, there was an aspiration shared by, by many audiences, filmmakers, people who eventually would be associated with, uh, with filmmaking, as critics, journalists, to, to elevate cinema into something that would be considered a serious art practice. Okay, so in some ways, I mean, you know, the association of art with cinema actually begins from this aspiration to elevate cinema to the status of a serious art. Now, of course, another thing that I document in the first part of the book is are the many uh, mutations that the category undergoes over a period of time. I mean, and the height of that is actually the 1960s and 70s, when you find that the category art cinema sort of fragments into multiple names. Some are calling it the time of the Indian new wave, new cinema, political cinema, radical cinema, middle cinema, parallel cinema. And one of the things I say is that when there are so many names given to the same object, as it were, it tells you something about the politics of naming, you know, the, or put differently, the politics of naming is never innocent. It actually tells you that there are very deep uh, attachments that people have to the set of objects that are being named as such. Okay, so in in that chapter, in the chapter on the Indian New Wave, which is uh, the second one in the book, I discuss some of that history and ask well, what was new in the Indian New Wave, which was also the title of a very famous essay by, by Satyajit Ray, where he asked the same question and his answer was no. Whereas uh, I depart from him and I, I actually make an argument for what was new in the Indian New Wave. And then subsequent to that, I have a chapter on film societies. And that goes to the heart of the question you asked as to whether or not art cinema is an elite practice. And you find that the, the desire, the commitment to watch what people understood to be good films, and there was no consensus actually on what constituted good films. Even the meaning of good films kept shifting over, over time. The desire to watch those actually was was quite widespread. I mean, and it in in some ways it makes us question our understanding of what we what we mean by elites. You know, do we mean an economic elite? Do we mean an elite of the intellect? Do we mean uh, elites who who also want to consider themselves a particular kind of cinephiles or aesthetes? I mean, so even even the meaning of what one might consider elite is something that you find uh, contested in, in the work that I do in, in that chapter. But coming, so, so, so really in those first three chapters of the book, I, I discuss the way in which the category first made its appearance in post-colonial India, the role played by, by many individuals and institutions. And some of those individuals were, were, were not from India. So for example, Mari Seaton plays an important role in in the struggles to elevate film into the status of an art and to open up indian film cultures to you know to not just hollywood hollywood was already there but really to non indian non hollywood films but also kind of multiply the meaning of what constituted Indian cinema. So there was a lot of space given to different regional cinemas. And that's something I, I document in the first part of the book. Eventually, as I said, the film society movement with whose history I actually commenced on this project, that was one of the first things I wrote, became forums for countless debates on Indian cinema for the exhibition of Indian and foreign films that did not get theatrical releases, for documentaries that were censored by the state, and for many new wave films from across the world. Importantly, what is forgotten in the film historical record are 
accounts of how passionate debates around cinema can be. So I just wanted to show you some slides of some of, you know, some of some of the individuals who were who played an important role in these early days. There's Murray Seaton, there's Ray. This is from a book uh, that, that Seaton wrote. Uh, this is, again, it goes back to the period of the Indian New Wave. Um, it's, it's actually a still from an FFC uh, catalog. These are some, uh, these are from some film society uh, journals and programs. This is Chitralekha Film Society, the one founded by Adur Gopalakrishnan and Kulatur Bhaskaran Nayar in Kerala. This is from one of their early programs. It's, it's the program note uh, on Battleship Potemkin. This is from, um, it's, it's, it's the close-up magazine that was published by the Film Forum in Bombay. There were two important uh, film societies at the time. There was Anandam and Film Forum, and then several, many others came up. But these were two very robust ones. And here's another one from, from, from Bombay. Uh, it was, and it's actually the publication of the Anandam Film Society. It's uh, their journal, Montage. Some other film society publications in Bangla, uh, Movie Montage and Chitra Bikhan. And now let me come to the third aspect of of this element of forgotten futures. You know, again, I've been asked many times that why do I say forgotten in talking about three filmmakers, uh, Ray, Ghatak, and Rinal Sen, who, who happened, you know, who are at least to a certain generation of Indians among the best known filmmakers. So what's forgotten about them? So why, why do I say forgotten, in other words? Now, that is because what I try to analyze and retrieve from their works from the 1960s onwards and really intensifying in the 1970s are some cinematographic strategies for contemplating how to comport oneself towards a disorienting post-colonial present that produced no distinct sense of future. As I note in the book, and I, I'm, I'm reading from the book, while critical literature often pits these figures, Sen, Ray, and Ghatak, as if they were each other's counterpoints, I see them as each other's necessary counterparts. Their trilogies, and I'm actually referring to the later trilogy, so not the Appu trilogy, for Ray, the City trilogy, Brinal Sen's Calcutta trilogy, and Ghatak, of course, made only one trilogy. So their trilogies led to fierce debates, especially within film societies, but also without, about film's place in thinking about radical social change. Sen, Ray, and Ghatak thus appear in my book as historians working through a new medium, film. Their insights into the evolving uncertainties of the post-colonial condition are my primary interest. Those insights have kept this body of films alive. The various strategies of the films discussed here, deployed to document the manifold contradictions at the heart of the present without the lures of any grand historical resolution, have not lost their relevance. They speak, I argue, to our own times when various crises of planetary proportions leave us disoriented and unmoored from any emancipatory visions of human futures. Art cinema itself has become a cinematic practice of the past. But the films by Ray, Sen, and Ghatak have much to say to us about how one might devise strategies for narrating times that Amitav Ghosh has described as the great derangement. Art Cinema in India's Forgotten Future analyzes the aesthetic strategies that they adopted for what Donna Haraway in a different context calls staying with the trouble. As I argue, 
and I quote from the book again, a dynamic attunement to temporality constituted art cinema as a mode of post-colonial historical understanding. The position of art cinema in the 1960s, as I describe it, is thus more radical than its break with a history of established cinematic form and practice." Unquote. Now, in the time remaining, let me illustrate for you how this historiographical operation takes place by turning to Mrinal Sen's Calcutta trilogy, Interview, 1970, Calcutta 71, that came out in 1972, and Padatik, from 1973. All three films were set in Sen's city, Sen's native city, Calcutta. The figure of an angry young Bengali male youth at its core, Sen's Calcutta trilogy opens up ways for thinking about cinema in a milieu that was caught, in a, caught up in a maelstrom of leftist politics and violence in West Bengal, Sen's home state, and in other parts of India. The film's narratives, carried ample references to radical Marxist and Maoist youth of uh, Ma Maoist youth of the day. Tempting though it is to see them as a mirror of the city of Calcutta during, these turbul during the turbulent period of the 1960s and the early 1970s, Sen's Calcutta trilogy, I argue, was far more ambitious in scope. Through the medium of the fiction film, the director presents us with his unique reading of 20th century Indian history that culminated in the post-colonial present. These films can, can be viewed, I argue, as a way of historicizing the tumultuous present of the early 1970s in Calcutta. Understudied, Understudied and largely forgotten, except by avid Bengali cineasts, this historicizing impulse of Sen's trilogy makes it a productive site for the analysis of political cinema, a category that was often used in the commentarial literature uh, to make sense of this period. Critical viewers, often judged the films for how efficaciously they mirrored contemporary political aspirations and conditions. Many critics, especially those of the left, judged the trilogy for whether or not they represented the worldview of politically radical youth of the day. The films were either celebrated as texts of revolution or denigrated for being misguided and reactionary. As I demonstrate in the chapter entitled Anger and After, they were neither. The Calcutta trilogy is set, as I've said, in the context of the turbulent politics of Calcutta in the late 1960s and 70s. But Sen also always placed Calcutta against a global history of the left, of the Vietnam War, the political movements of Latin America and Africa. In the book, I revisit the three films to delineate a critical genealogy of contemporary anger that Sen offered. That genealogy offers a key to his interpretation of the 20th century, of the 20th century he inhabited. I should say here that in conjoining anger with youth, Sen's trilogy arguably marked the first on-screen appearance of the figure of the angry young man in Indian cinema. Authoritative studies of the angry young man have analyzed the personification of this trope through the star persona of Amitabh Bachchan in popular Hindi cinema. And I'm thinking here of works by Madhav Prasad, Ranjani Mazumdar and others. Coincidentally, the last film of Sen's trilogy, Padatik, uh, that you see here, uh, that was released in 1973 was the same year that Bachchan incarnated the angry young man in popular Hindi cinema through his role as Vijay Khanna in Zanjeer. But Sen's angry young man had very little in common with Bachchan's numerous Vijay characters. And I trace that genealogy in some detail in my book. <clears throat> 
Suffice it to note here that Sen's youth were marked by a striking difference, uh, by a striking absence, I beg your pardon, of revenge towards a single individual or entity. Nor were they fueled by any sense of injury to the family that is almost always represented as a good in itself in popular Hindi films. While both figures speak to the life worlds of Indian youth in the years leading up to the emergency in 1975, Sen's protagonists carry the ideological burden of the left. They lack the heroic charisma and the immense powers exercised by Bachchan. For Sen, youth, rather than representing a growth, a stage in the growth of an individual, is a permanent condition for the possibility of the birth of political anger. Anger, a generalized feeling, rather than directed at a single individual or group, is their only affect, and we see a profusion of it on screen. It is perhaps to flag the systemic role of the city and to explain the rage generated among its male youth from just living in it, that Sen chose to insert it into the title of the second film of the trilogy, Calcutta 71. But as I said, Calcutta was also always seen in the context of a global history of the left. As he clarified, as Sen clarified in conversations, Calcutta presented him with a mirror through which to view the conditions prevailing in India and in other parts of Afro-Asia and Latin America. Sen's trilogy coincided with a set of films by Ray that also centered on the city and also had a male protagonist that, that I focus on in another chapter of the book. Contemporaries saw the output of both filmmakers comparatively, as did Sen himself. But Sen's Calcutta trilogy was markedly different from Ray's. The narrative structure of the films were varied and that they held together as a trilogy was due to both certain deliberate formal strategies, as well as Sen's attempt to synthesize the narratives to make a larger historical argument. So if you watch the films, you'll find that all three have shots featuring important Calcutta landmarks like the, the race course, the Victoria Memorial, the Calcutta University, Dalhousie Square, All India Radio, the Victor, uh, as I said, the Victoria Memorial, as well as documentary and, uh, and still footage of local and global events. Shots of popular Hindi and Bengali film posters, newspaper headlines, statues of imperial and nationalist figures, processions and picketing, police firings, images of Mao Zedong, Ho Chi Minh, the Viet Cong, and African soldiers are common to all three films. They situate post-colonial Calcutta against this backdrop of global protest movements in other parts of what we refer to as the global south. Likewise, a profusion of techniques made popular by filmic new waves and cinema verite, such as free, freeze frames, jerky camera movements, montage interviews, um, the use of documentary and still footage that Sen had himself also been filming, uh, been shooting in the in, on the streets of Calcutta from 1969, infuse in viewers who watch all three films a sense of continuum. More than any of these features, however, the coherence of the trilogy as a trilogy was due to the way that Sen organically built up a programmatic argument about anger and its aftermath. Seen thus, the films, those situated in the present, actually spanned a longer temporal arc and possessed a unity <clears throat> that prevailed over their episodic nature. Sen's trilogy, unlike Ray's Apu trilogy, is not the history of the becoming of an individual. Its focus, rather, is an emotion, anger. And its history 
And the history of that emotion that manifests itself in the different characters of the film, but is really being affected on to the body of the citizen as the dominant feature of, of Indian politics. Sen maps the trajectory of this emotion and invites intellectual scrutiny of its politics over the course of the three films. Interview, the first film in the trilogy, is a satirical film about a single day in the life of a young, rather pedestrian Bengali man, Ranjit, that ends with an extraordinary twist. Ranjit manages to land a job interview through his father's friend's connections in a Scottish company, and he goes looking for a suit, which is considered to be the accepted attire for the interview. And you, you see what happens through the day. To cut a long story short, he fails to get a suit. He appears for the interview in a dhoti kurta and doesn't get the job. And unable to find a suit, he, he as I said, he appears in a dhoti kurta and is rejected from the position. In the film's closing sequence, we witness an angry and frustrated Ranjit venting his anger on a mannequin that's dressed in a suit. And I'll play this clip in a second, and I hope uh, it'll play properly. That's correct. venting his anger at the mannequin uh, that's dressed in a suit. Now, ostensibly, the film, temporarily situated in a moment when Calcutta was in a state of lockdown due to strikes of all kinds, including one by cine workers, actually, that is shown in the film. Um, ostensibly, the film actually merges Ranjit's anger into a larger landscape of political protest by students, workers, and peasants, not just in West Bengal, or even India, but globally. And that's why you have the framing shots of Calcutta, Calcutta protesters appearing alongside stills and footage of Vietnamese peasants, Indian tribals, and soldiers in, in, in Biafra and so on. One way of reading this collocation of images would be to see Ranjit as the personification of the anger of the every man in Calcutta. His anger is as if awakened by the, by the experiences of the day that merged into revolutionary protests witnessed in the city and in other parts of the world during this time. At the same time, everything that we have seen of Ranjit suggests that his rage is not fueled by any extraordinary sense of purpose. True, he is victim of a larger system, systemic, systemic failure that, that consists of crumbling infrastructure, petty corruption, an inept and callous bureaucracy on the one hand, and unemployment, penury, and want on the other. But as the voice that keeps recurring throughout the film like a conscience or a chorus keeps reminding uh, Ranjit, and really the audience too, that Ranjit is not above desiring a larger income that is often substituted by, uh, or that is going to be substituted if he were to have that larger income, by commissions and kickbacks. It is almost as if Sen was inviting us to think of what would happen to Ranjit if he was successful in the interview. Would he not be another addition to a smug middle class 
cocooned in unreflective security. Ranjit's solipsism is especially evident in the scenes of his, with his mother and sister, who cater to his everyday needs. Sen often uses gender to critique the angry young man, to underscore that this is no tale of a rising consciousness or revolutionary becoming. There is no indication throughout that Ranjit desires change in anything but his own income. His single-minded focus is on a better job, or is on any job, really. Um, at no point do we get any sense of his political inclinations. He becomes a protester against the injustices of forces outside his control, driven by his particular circumstances and not out of ideological conviction. While Sen portrays these circumstances sympathetically, is there enough evidence to constitute Ranjit as a revolutionary figure? If not, what meaning do we attribute to his decision to merge Ranjit's anger, the anger of an ordinary man impelled by his unique circumstances with images of global revolutionary protests, a world-scale revolution as, as, uh, or a world-scale mobilization as uh, Sen referred to it in an interview. Is it the case that all revolutionary anger arises out of self-interest? Or is ideology blind to the needs of the everyman? What, if any, relationship is there between ordinariness and revolution? Some of these issues return in Calcutta 71. Why 71? was a question raised by many critical discussants of the film, Calcutta 71, which was by far the most widely debated film in Sen's trilogy. 71 was the culmination of sorts to the political instability that reigned throughout the 1960s in parts of India, Bengal preeminent among them. The Bangladesh War of 1971, the massive influx of refugees from Bangladesh, shortages in power and food, the rise of Maoism, the burning and destruction of schools and colleges, college buildings by, by, by Naxal activists inspired by Maoist ideology, strikes, lockouts, widespread black marketeering. With all of these things, 1971 was a historical moment whose impact was long term but whose implications still remain understudied in Indian history. Calcutta 71, claimed Sen, was his way of historicizing the conflicting passions that culminated in this critical year. Closer home in West Bengal and its capital, Calcutta, the power of a leftist coalition of political parties continued to grow from the late 60s, despite the electoral setback of 1971. Internal factionalism within that coalition was rife, as was a tripartite struggle between different political formations, the Congress, the left, and the radical, ultra-radical Maoists. These struggles produced an atmosphere of fear and suspicion to which extrajudicial killings by the police, murders and bombings added an element of terror. Insurgent violence was matched measure for measure by a government repression. The film, contrary to the polarized opinions that followed its release, is expressive of the impossibility of being partisan, and partisan is a word that Sen keeps using, it's actually about the impossibility of being partisan to any particular political line or view. It engaged the contemporary condition in a historical vein. Like interview, what we witness here in a more elaborated form is an attempt to understand anger, the preeminent public emotion irrespective of which side of the political spectrum one belonged to. Anger, argued Sen, was not the monopoly of only those who wished to shake up the status quo. I think this is a very relevant statement. 
It was not the monopoly of only those who wished to stay, shake up the status quo. Those who were invested in maintaining the established order of things experienced anger in equal measure. Sen's portrayal of the so-called establishment is much more comprehensive in Calcutta 71 than it was in interview. It encompassed the family, civil society, and state, all variously dysfunctional. Anger is a pervasive response of all those who felt helpless in the vice grip of each of these institutions. In many interviews, Sen emphasized that it was important for him to establish that, quote, our history, that is the history of Calcutta and of India, was one of exploitation, deprivation, and poverty. Communicating to viewers this sense of history was the lead motive of the film. This statement helps us unpack the episodic structure of Calcutta 71 that begins in the present, but then loops back to the past to track the history of three decades, the, 40, the 30s, 40s, and 50s, for each of which Sen chose three representative short stories by Manik Bantupadhyay, Prabodh Shannal, and Shomaresh Poshu. Before returning to the present, which was, it skips the 1960s and returns to 71. Each episode was linked to the next with, uh, with, by a rolling intertitle, and I'll, 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 I'll play this in a second, and a buildup of anger among different segments of society and the voiceover of a 20-year-old witness of history. So let me play uh, this, this, this clip. And what you'll see is that, I mean, if you watch the film, you'll find that common to all three episodes is actually the theme of famine. Famine for Sen was a human condition that stripped human beings of dignity. Just as the partition was a lifelong preoccupation for Ghatak, so, the, so too was the famine for Sen. Understanding the implications of, of the famine was a vital component to his project of redefining history. As he said, he wanted to depict the most vital aspect of our history, which was the physical look of hang hunger. That look, he argued, remains the same over time. What changed were people's per perceptions about poverty and their responses to it. He calls this the dialectics of hunger, the dialectics of poverty. Rage, blind and without a single target, seems to be the only response available to people caught in the blocked dialectic of poverty. And you'll get a sense of this from... Uh, from this 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 little clip and I'll 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 speak to it in in a little bit. আমি এখানে কেন এসেছি জানেন? আমি আপনাদের বলতে এসেছি আমাকে কারা মেরেছে আমি জানি। কিন্তু আমি তাদের নাম বলবো না। আমি চাই আপনারা নিজেরা তাদের খুঁজে বার করুন। খুঁজতে কি আপনারা কষ্ট পান, যন্ত্রণা পান এমন নিশ্চিন্ত থাকতে পারবেন না। এমন নিষ্প্রিহ থাকতে পারবেন না। छिड़े टुकड़ो टुकड़ो कष्ट रागे शर रिड़ी कर মনে হলো ওরা আবার এসেছে আমাকে মারতে এসেছে যারা সারা দেশ জুড়ে আমাকে খুঁজে বেরিয়েছে তাড়িয়ে বেরিয়েছে আমার কি অপরাধ জানেন আমি দেখেছি সব দেখেছি অত্যাচার অবিচার অন্যায় সব দেখেছি যুগ যুগ ধরে হাজার বছর ধরে আমার এই so this 
that particular shot actually occurs in 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 the last episode of the film in which initially sen starts to unveil the faces of the what he calls the merchants of oppression and just as we witness the multiple oppressors politicians socialites police political parties the screen goes dark and it it's as if the screen goes dark to put a break on our impulse to hastily label any single group as the oppressor and instead we hear the plangent voice of that 20 year old witness of history who you know who's in, who's suddenly illuminated by the shaft of light and you saw what he says to viewers he says that i'm dead i've actually if you watch the film you realize that he's the person who was killed at the beginning of the film in a, a, a firing in the calcutta maidan sense and the 20 year olds and therefore sense refusal to name the agent of oppression and thereby subscribe to contemporary theories of revolutionary social transformation did not go down well for many critics of the yardsticks of a political cinema or of the arts more generally were those outlined by mao in his 1942 address on art and literature in yenan everything else was re- reactionary stasis that film could be a sovereign mode of intellection about the present attentive to but not freighted by the baggage of ideology did not seem like a possibility critical viewers projected onto calcutta 71 their own anxieties and expectations about what a right kind of political film ought to be the gap between the views expressed by critics and the situation that sen sought to address in the trilogy is are perhaps best captured in some reminiscences by the director though the official commencement of shooting of calcutta 71 began in 1970 Sen had been filming as i said footages of rallies and processions that eventually made their way into the film from 69 these sequences became quote unexpected evidence unquote of people who later disappeared or were disappeared sen wrote young boys would keep coming back perhaps with their family and their friends they would watch the film over and over again just to catch just for another glimpse of their friends another time a young woman fainted upon catching a glimpse of her son on screen he had later been shot by the police many people who were wanted by the police were were arrested from the serpentine queues outside metro cinema where the film was exhibited as sen put it in an interview conducted in uh, 2001 the times mattered a lot while the quality of the film is an important factor he said equally important is the timing of the whole thing now my goal in is in, in in recounting these details is to establish that calcutta 71 is unthinkable without its relationship to contemporary history at the same time then also urged viewers to visualize a situation where an angry young man murdered a traffic constable as the dead constable quote lay in a pool of his own blood a few vegetables rolled out of his pocket perhaps he was supposed to return home from his duties and cook himself a meager meal perhaps in that moment when he lay dead his wife in some remote village was trying to scrape together her scarce resources to repay the local money lender perhaps the money mailed by her now dead husband had not yet arrived forcing her to pawn the last metal plate in the house the humanism of this imaginary tale also illustrated sen's predicament one that he tried to narrativeize through the history of anger in calcutta 71 for sen both the constable and the young man who killed him were victims of deprivation and of poverty but the system of which they were both parts pitted them against one another in a battle of mutual annihilation calcutta 71 was his attempt however uneven its formal execution to portray the injustice 
that saturated the giant sclerotic faceless system. There was no friend or enemy in Calcutta 71, but multiple pathways to anger. In conclusion, and you know, in the interest of space, I won't talk about Podati, but just conclude. Let me turn to an essay by Sen entitled Itihashe Rasroy or Sheltered by History that first appeared in Bengali in the 1990s and spoke eloquently to, the, to some of the themes that I've discussed. In it, an argumentative young man, reminiscent of Sen's protagonist in Podatik, the film I didn't discuss, Podatik literally means the guerrilla fighter, or foot, it literally means the foot soldier, but it was actually subtitled as the guerrilla fighter. So in this essay, Itihashe Rasroy, an argumentative young man, reminiscent of Sen's protagonist in Podatik, questions an elderly gentleman, presumably someone belonging to the same generation as Sen. The stories you tell, he charges, of war, of violence, famine, should have scorched your faces with the flames from funeral pyres. But look at you, every one of you so smug and settled. You seem to have made a killing out of this history you're so fond of. The events the older generation claimed to have witnessed found shelter under the protective folds of a particular history. History for the fictional youth, as told in textbooks, was a progressive march of time, frozen and sanitized as chronological moments in succession. History minimized the scale of tragedy. Evidently, Sen shared some of the youth's concern about liberating history from the stasis that froze it into a litany of facts and into a developmental chain in books. The Calcutta trilogy represented his efforts to connect the past to events we must witness daily. The deaths, the dying, the killing on the pavements of the city or splashed across the pages of the newspapers. At the same time, he acknowledged that leaders of independent India, he meaning Sen, acknowledged that leaders of independent India possessed no magic wands with which to wave away the problems of the people. Once the festivities that accompanied freedom were over, the realization seeped in that nothing had really been solved. The cumulative effects of these developments produced unspeakable anger. In Sen's words, quote, and the minute the collective patient snapped, there were instant incidents of random bombings and callous shoot shootouts. In fact, at one point, emergency had to be declared. While the films, films under consideration focused on the persistent neocolonialism in the post-colony, the removal of colonial vestiges alone were no guarantee to a better life until the greater problem of famine, figuratively speaking, was dealt with. Take the example of Maoist rebels and other political leaders emphasizing the removal of colonial and nationalist era statues in Calcutta. But could the removal of statues alone ensure an erasure of the past? It was more important to probe the ways in which the birth of the new state fundamentally altered or not the conditions of daily life for the mass of the people. In light of all this, it is not surprising that for Sen, the history of India over the long 20th century is best told as the history of poverty. Understanding poverty could provide a key to interpreting the restlessness, the turbulence of the period that was 1971. Poverty was the genesis to the anger that had not suddenly fallen out of somewhere. It must have a beginning and an end. And Sen wanted to find that genesis and in the process redefine our history. Sen's angry young man was the embodiment of a complex and contradictory array of, of political sentiments that I've tried to discuss. While this figure has had a rich and enduring life in Indian popular cinema, 
incarnated through Amitabh Bachchan, it had that figure had none of the irony that Sen packed into his portrayal of the angry young man. It was an ironical stance that ranged across his portrayal of this figure's immersion in revolutionary ideology to his obliviousness of skewed gender equations in family and society. Much of the political ambivalence that was constitutive of Sen's protagonists disappeared from Hindi cinema's angry young man. It is that genealogy of his previous on-screen life that I've tried to present as art film's apprehension of the post-colonial present. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Majumda, for that wonderful introduction to the whole art cinema and also the films of, most importantly, uh, Mrinal Sen. And uh, I was making notes the whole time and, <laughs> and I've made some, uh, some points that you mentioned, especially the angry young man as portrayed by Mrinal Sen and how you kind of uh, compare it with what was there in the mainstream, quote unquote, mainstream Hindi cinema of that time, the portrayal of Amitabh as the uh, angry young man. And also the most interesting part, I think, uh, in the book also is that you start, as you mentioned, that you start with it, a whole introduction, a general introduction of the global art cinema and how it, it developed the importance of, uh, uh, you know, there was this, this government project of uh, good cinema for creating good citizens that is also a question that i would ask you and then you also in the second part you go into details of you know uh, ghatak the erasure of memory or the or you know the absence of historicism in satyajit ray and also the angry uh, kind of contemporary and also their relation with history in uh, mirnal sen's book uh, in in films you, you have taken three trilogies that you mentioned, the partition trilogy of, uh, of Ritwik Ghatak and the Saints interview, Calcutta 71 and Patadik that we couldn't discuss today and raise uh, Pratidwandi, Seema Baddha and Jana Aranya. And uh, in this, you also very interestingly mentioned the difference between Saints and race view of Calcutta as a city. Whereas, you know, Ghatak's films dealt with the, the pain and agony of, you know, partition, uh, though he said he was not a filmmaker of pain. And, uh, and you also mentioned how Sain's films also portrayed the global history of the time, especially the left movement that was going on, the Maoist uh, movement, and also the time, the contemporary time. So it was a mixture of contemporary setting with history uh, of the time. And in Ray's film, uh, on the other hand, there's a the, the films portray a transformation of Ray as a mere chronicle of the time to more of an ethnographer. You know, the, the, yeah. and mm -hmm. uh, we see the the narration of contemporary rather than history. So that I think uh, that is how you kind of develop the whole book, starting from pure historical setting in Ghatak to more like a mixture of both history and contemporary and then a, com a completely contemporary setting in, uh, in, in Satyajit Ray's film. So my question to you is how do you now place cities because we talked about Calcutta in general, how do you situate city as spaces in films and uh, especially of later art cinema filmmakers like Adur, Shyam and, uh, and Kumar Shahani? Could you repeat the question again? So how do I place the city in the works of these other filmmakers that you mentioned, the later day filmmakers? Gosh, that's a big and difficult question. I mean, um, so at the outset, let me say that, um, you know, one of the things that I find really productive about um, productive in thinking about these films is just the way in which they, they bring out each region of India in all its specificity. And uh, without necessarily making a case that, you know, it has to be generalized as the experience of the whole country. 
Um, and I think that that would that would really apply when to to thinking about these later filmmakers. So, for example, when you watch Adur Gopalakrishnan's films, they are very particular to the the socio political aspects of Kerala. Uh, I mean, so for example, the kind of gender politics you see, the kind, the, you know, the decline of matrilineal that you see, the kind, I mean, even um, even the particular inflections of, of Marxism that you see are very particular to the experience of Kerala. They may have overlaps with other parts of the country, but they are by no means identical. So when you ask, so I would say that uh, one thing that art films give us, regardless of the distaste that some filmmakers, or the, not distaste, but the discomfort that some filmmakers might feel with that label, is, is actually a, a granular understanding of, of Indian cities, where no one city sort of stands in for for every everything else you know so there's no kind of quintessential indian city like bombay as you you see in 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 popular cinema um i yeah i think that's what i would say in response that uh each each filmmaker i think has a very different portrayal of how they think about the city and frankly i think you mentioned you mentioned benegal right i mean in his in his early films you actually do not see the city uh, I mean, there's no city in Angkor or Manthan or Nishant. It's much later that uh, you see any city. So there's that also. Uh, I mean, and, you know, I'll, I mentioned this briefly in, in chapter two, that one of the things that many of these filmmakers do is to bring certain regions of India that you hadn't seen on screen uh, before, they, 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 they present some of those regions. So for example, you know, you see, you see uh, the Punjab in, in, in Manikal, you see uh, certain parts of Gujarat in Bhuvan Shom. So similarly, like they, they're focused on, on, on certain regions that we are not, or we weren't until then used to seeing on Indian screens. And again, there's a, political economy of why that was. But anyway, that's a long answer to, to your question. But thank you for reading the book so carefully. And you know, you mentioned the quintessential city of Bombay and how these filmmakers explore the, re the regions unknown to the, to the audience. But sometimes uh, if we take an example of a, of a filmmaker of the late 70s, like Saeed Akhtar Mirza, who showed Bombay, a region that was known to his audience already, but he showed it in a new light where you see the union. Familiar. Yeah. 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 That's another interesting aspect of the portrayal of city as spaces, uh, which is uh, continuously being contested among communities. So I for think sure. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Because I think exactly, I mean, you know, even like, Calcutta, for example, had been shown before that, but it the this the I mean Sen's Calcutta or even uh, you know the Calcutta that Ray shows in his Calcutta trilogy, they defamiliarize it from what we had seen hitherto. So, um, my next question is the women's question: uh, How women? Because we talked about the the male protagonist in the film, but. Uh, you know, in race film, women's, as you mentioned, as ciphers, unlike their male counterparts, and there's this con complexities, and they aren't fleshed out in the films so clearly or defined as the male uh, protagonist. And in Ghatak's film, there is this sacrificial lamb and, uh, and, and scene projected as the disillusionment kind of thing with the lack of, inter you know, uh, the lack of women's movement, the, the portrayal of women's movement in his films. So how do you see the women's question in all these three filmmakers that you explore in the book? Well, as you say, uh, as you said that they're not identical in how they, uh, they think about women. I mean, to stick with Ray for, the, for a minute, and maybe I'll just read out a little bit from the book. 
to um, so what I say there is that his early works, Ray's early works, that is demonstrated an abiding interest and commitment to the women's question in modernity and modernization. There was even an archetypal Ray woman. I mean, you know, Ray woman is, it's his words, a normative female subject uh, that emerged from his early corpus. And this is how he described her characteristics. He writes, although they're physically not as strong as men, nature gave women qualities which compensate for the fact. They're more honest, more direct, and by and large, they're stronger characters. I'm not talking about every woman, but the woman I like to put in my films is better able to cope with situations than men, unquote. Charulata was the archetypal Ray woman. Now, what I say about the city films is that is that women in the city films, um, I mean, so in other words, right from the Apu trilogy through Charulata into Mohanagar, the emergence of women as modern subjects, I write, is mapped through education, writing, employment, and protest, even as that emergence places tremendous pressure on the couple and the family. The city films represent the end of that project of individual societal and historical development. Women in the city films, as I argue, are ciphers, an admission perhaps of the fact that Ray was more confounded by this new woman uh, than he, uh, that he saw around him than he was by men. And all the city films centered around his men, his male protagonists, their complexities and quirks are fleshed out, even when women occupy a lot of screen time. So, for example, in Company Limited, you have Sharmila Tagore's character who occupies a lot of screen time. But women, insofar as they featured in the city films, I think, occur there as, as you know, their function is to deepen our view of the crisis of masculinity. I mean, it's as if, and, and I think that this happens to a large extent. I mean, it happens in Ray. It also happens to a, to a lesser extent in Sen. So when you watch interview, you find that Sen's critique of, the, of, of Ranjit, the protagonist, is in some ways expressed through, through, through gender. Now, um, yeah, so, and then, you know, and then there is Ghatak, whose women are, are, an, are a whole different, uh, or whose, whose take on gender is a, is a whole different uh, thing altogether. Now, but at the same time, I think that for each of these filmmakers, Gender is actually a very important uh, critical device through which they consider um, consider Indian history. Thank you so much for that. And uh, my next question is uh, about uh, it's it's not related to it's not in the in the book itself, but uh, it's the difference between Ghatak's approach and uh, Ray's approach and the symbolism of uh, a train in both these films are quite different. Both their films are quite different. Like in, uh, in, 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 in Pathir Panchali, you see uh, a train as a symbol of modernity or transformation, but in Meghi Dhakatara, the, the, the uh, Ritu Ghatak's film, you see it as a, as an icon, a symbol of pain and agony of partition. So how do you kind of compare both these similar thing, but different meanings? Well, you said it. Uh, I mean, it's it's true that, uh, you know, the train plays a very important role in throughout the trilogy, throughout the Opu trilogy. But oftentimes we only fix our gaze on Pothir Panchali. I mean, if you think about the, the train in 
In Oparajito, for example, you'll find that, uh, that it's both about it's both about modernization, but also the, the disruption, the and also the you know the the, the pain that uh, that accompanies these processes of modernization. So when Apu and his mother are returning from Banaras to back to their village, um, actually back to Shorbojoya's natal village. That journey is actually not, it's not a celebratory developmental journey. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a return journey back. It's actually talking about the, the discomfort of uprooting, the pain of uprooting. Then later on when, you know, when, when Apu decides to actually go to Calcutta and she sits outside in the courtyard and there again, there is the reference to the train and uh, the train that actually separates or breaks up families. Now, obviously, it's not the train to, you know, it's not the partition train, which has uh, horrific memories, right, for, for, for us. But I think, again, I mean, it would be a little naive, I think, to see Ray as an uncritical uh, celebrant of modernization. I mean, the the it, it's a very complex portrayal of of development and modernization with all its attendance, attendant uh, losses and disruptions. But it, it's a great yeah, it's a great question, and I think I think others have also considered this. You know the the importance of the train, and I think increasingly now in in film studies, people are looking at the place of particular objects, you know, whether it's trains, whether it's uh, telephones, and try, I mean, or there are different ways in which you think about, how shall I put it, the energy question in, in, in these films. It's not something I do in, in the book, but it, I think there's renewed attention to, uh, to objects and technology within cinema. Definitely. And it's kind of interesting to see that, as you mentioned, they, they coincide at a certain point that is pain is you know, visible in both these uh, interpretation of a train. Uh, as I said, my uh, next question would be uh, about good cinema for creating good citizens. Uh, that's the government mandate when it all started the, the post-colonial settings. So how do you see... Uh, government's role in promoting good cinema or quote unquote art cinema and also is is uh, all art cinema is good cinema that's also another aspect of this scene but since liberalization the, the 1990s how do you see the change uh, the shift in government's role in promoting because after that the nfdc kind of you know in the it started in 1980 but it started like de degrading itself and now it's almost non-existent in the in the game. So um, you know, as I say in the book, that I don't equate the art cinema project. I, I don't say that it's completely a status project. I don't think it ever was. Besides, I I mean, the Indian state was an inchoate structure. There were uh, there were some forces within it that actually saw the power of cinema, but it would be I'm not of the view that actually sees the Indian state as this kind of really organized behemoth you know that was actually delineating every aspect of culture that said there were some governmental efforts actually there was a lot of anxiety I would say on the part of the government about how to marshal this technology which 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 see it's it's a you know it's a technology for the masses. So how do you put it to the best use? I think that was the anxiety of the government. On the part of people in uh, in films, it was there were a lot of anxieties. The first of which would be to you know to be taken seriously by the state, to not be regarded as something that's merely for entertainment. And there, I think they don't. 
take seriously enough the power the power of entertainment but in any case when i think in 1947 the project of good cinema and the project of good citizen were were parallel projects that's one of the arguments that i make in the book but grad, but they were not identical to say that they were parallel projects is not to say that they were identical projects which is why i mean um you know there are still plenty of critiques if you will of modernization and development even in these early films but that parallelism i think gets broken or dislodged from the 1960s onwards and again i say that I, i read out this part to you i i write this book documents how the aspiration to make good good films became dislodged from the aspiration to make good citizens as that relation came undone in the 1960s and 70s the consensus over historical time that informed intellectual elites thinking about the post colonial nation also changed instead of a progressive development art cinema in india reconceptualized a sense of the present as pregnant with multiple contradictory possibilities as if historical time had become fragmented in some instances making only the present legible and in others many futures so now to the second question that you asked about liberalization now again you know i i'm not um as you know the book actually stops in the 80s and i don't really i mean i'm not i follow uh recent developments but i it would it's not my subject i mean i'm a historian so it's uh, it's not something that i would claim myself to be an expert on by any stretch of the imagination but i think one thing that happens with liberalization is that i mean the state continues to be important but then so are many other things because you know liberalization and globalization sort of have have made it a bigger stage and now we have things like you know platforms to consider so we have like the ott platforms and on the one side on the one hand yes these are signs of neoliberal capitalism on the other they actually make possible the making of many different kinds of films and making those available to many different kinds of audiences so uh, and i think there'll be scholar there already is scholarship on what that enables and what that prevents um but again that's not my expertise uh i'm not i'm not ducking the question i'm just saying that it's just a very large arena no that that's understood and yes uh, you you end with 1980s and uh, uh, you you give the uh, example of uh, atten varos gandhi um and so we will we'll, we'll conclude in about 15 minutes we have some questions from the audience uh, that okay. i think are very interesting so if you allow we can take three or four questions because there are many many questions so we'll limit ourselves to four questions uh, there is a question by krishnakant lahangi if the art cinema movement was like a remembrancious colloquium in which film cinephilia criticism and activism became the ground for debates about the present and future of indian democracy then why is partition so missing from it but i think partition was uh, there in ghatak uh, work what if we talk to address it well you answered it i mean partition was definitely there in ghatak's work partition recurs in in garam hawa and again i mean you know it's just it's difficult to say why certain topics and not others especially i mean when i, I think that was a quote from the book that there were many topics debated i mean partition i think many scholars have said this this is uh, it's not it's not a very original thing i'm saying it was a trauma for the generations that lived through it and i think in order to address something so traumatic there has to be a certain passage of time i mean you know even in ghatak i think the configuration of partition is not direct 
you know, it's not like Govind Nihalani making Tamas later on. I mean, even though that's an adaptation, but I think with more distance, you have more and more works on partition. I mean, even Garam Hawa in that sense is not really a partition film. It uh, it's 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 actually the it's looking at the the fate of a particular family that that remained in India. So I think um, I think there were people. I mean, so similarly, I think it's actually a mistake to say, "Oh, Ray is a filmmaker of development," because I, I, I mean, you know, they're not. They are. Uh, when I when I describe these filmmakers as historians, I mean, often you know, people mistake that to mean, "Oh, they were representing certain things on screen." They were doing that, but for me, to think of them as historians means they're they're analyzing something that is absolutely important to theorists of history, which is time. So it's not about this or that, like, you know, partition or famine or development or modernization, women's questions. I mean, all of these, yes, they, they figure as topics as they do in any other cinematic or art form. But um, yeah, the more interesting question is, how these are historiographic operations and that they are by, you know, through their, through the way in which they think about questions of time and space. Thank you for the question. Thank you for answering that, ma'am. Uh, Biswajit Das asks that, which filmmakers subject according to you look more eternal if we watch their films now when word or India is changing politically, economically, and socially? Well, one of eternal, I, I don't, I mean, again, it's, it's a word that makes me a little uncomfortable. But one of the things I say is that, look, ultimately, this book is also, you know, it's an, it's a, it's an interpretive exercise. Uh, there may be others who read them very differently, who watch them very differently. But I've often asked myself why I returned to these films. And I think I returned to them because they seemed to me to offer certain resources to living in our present, living with all the uncertainties that constitute our present. So I think all of them actually gave, felt as, you know, or I, I, I think of all of them as potentially offering us uh, resources to the present. So picking any anyone is a difficult exercise. I mean, I think, I think all, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I think there is a question, but I think that would require another lecture altogether. But Ishtiaq Ahmed's question is, uh, one can place Indian art cinema, particularly films of Sain, in the larger third cinema movement of the post-colonial world. Can you discuss it? But I think that would require another lecture in itself. So we will we'll skip that question. But there are some comments. Viswajit Ghosh uh, says Meghdha Katara is still so relevant about present day women's struggle in society. Uh, and all the three filmmakers, one of the subject was their surrounding Calcutta. Yeah. So I think those were the questions and the comments. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Majumda for taking out so much time Thank to deliver you. this lecture. Thank you. And I hope you Thank enjoyed you. the questions. And uh, uh, once and again, the third cinema question is a very crucial one. And I, I mean, you're right, it's a big question. And I, I write about it a little bit in the book. But I, again, I think there's going to be, you know, there's going to be more work thinking about. Uh, or revisiting the category third cinema, particularly because, you know, we've also transitioned from talking about the third world to talking about the global south. And I think it's important to revisit the category third cinema as this has occurred. So it's a very, I don't want to, it, it, it's, a, it's a critical question and one that I do not want to ignore, uh, nor do I have a full, fully articulated and fleshed out answer to it. But thank you very much, Ishan. And I hope that your, you know, I hope Karwan continues. Thank you so Thanks. much. Man. And once again, for those who are watching us, this is the book, Art Cinema in India's Forgotten Futures. 
it's available online and i think uh, in different bookstores in india and you must get it it's a surprisingly accessible academic book uh, because when we use the term academic book we really fear that it would be highly uh, researched which is uh, you know which the layman can't understand but this will surprise you because it's very accessible and that is why i read it and and got to know so much thank you so much ma'am we were trying to do this lecture for a very long time finally it happened and thank you so much thank everybody you. for joining in we'll meet again in a, for another lecture tomorrow at 10 30 am with robert p goldman on ramayana and mahabharat do not forget to join us um, and have a great evening ahead everyone